Welcome back, warriors, to the worst fighting game. My divine struggle to find the very best of the very worst in the hallowed realm of button bashers. Last time, we knocked out DBZ Taiketsu, a hideous CGI rendered rush job, and then Way of the Warrior, an unabashed Mortal Kombat ripoff. But this week, why don't we play something that combines the two in one grimy, sleazy package? Bone Storm was a mid-90s fighting game made by Incredible Technologies under their Strata Games label, with the goal being to usurp Mortal Kombat as the most violent fighting franchise ever made. Unfortunately, Bone Storm did no s- <laughs> I just said Bone Storm twice, uh... You idiot! Bloodstorm did no such thing. Despite a myriad of sneaky marketing tactics, this was Strata's last commercially released video game. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wait, Strata Games? Well, why aren't you covering Time Killers? And to that I say, I honestly think this is worse. Uh, please allow me to explain slash apologize. Time Killers was IT's very first attempt at a fighting game and released in 1992, super early in the fighting game boom since everyone was trying to see what worked and what didn't, so I gotta cut them just a sliver of slack. Bloodstorm, however, was released in 1994, a time where the genre was getting more complex via 3D graphics, combo systems, super attacks, etc. But incredible technologies rigidly stuck to just trying to outgore Mortal Kombat rather than, oh, I don't know, make a really good game. Maybe a reason why they were focusing solely on shock value rather than yeah, anything else was that they were pulling double duty, as they were also in pre-production avec Capcom for the arcade version of Street Fighter the movie, which sent a few key developers all the way over in Thailand to film JCVD and Kylie Minogue rubbing chunks. That, I mean, <laughs> filming them performing various Street Fighter special moves. Anyway, since Bloodstorm was a new IP, they needed some of that old razzle-dazzle to stand out from the pack, so the technology scientists at Incredible Technologies stuffed this storm with as much edgy shit as possible. Tons of blood, guts, codes, secret characters, and cheesy marketing stunts. One of the more minor ones was playing to the ego of notable magazine writers of the day via the special trash talk codes the players would be able to input. These referenced Electronic Gaming Monthly and even the always mysterious, always 90s Sushi X. Haha, <laughs> hope you enjoyed that little shout out EGM, especially around review time. But their most carny marketing maneuver was probably also the most memorable thing about Bloodstorm. In early 1994, MK1 and 2 actor Daniel Pessina, who played Scorpion, Sub-Zero, Reptile, and good old Johnny C, had a pay dispute with Midway, wanting to renegotiate his contract for more money since the MK franchise was now a phenomenon. Midway refused and simply didn't hire Daniel back to work on MK3, which is why Mr. Cage never appeared and the ninjas were recast for Ultimate MK3. Now, since both Midway and Incredible Technologies were based in the Chicago area, word spread fast, and the mad lads at IT made Piscina an offer. Come to our studio for an hour's worth of posing, uh, doing the splits, etc., and we'll pay you, uh, just name your price. This resulted in Bloodstorm's big gamble to lure MK fans over to their game, proudly and rather cheekily declaring that Johnny Cage had switched to Bloodstorm. Well, for years, the rumor was that it was this photo shoot that caused the rift between Pasina and Midway. Both he and MK co-creator John Tobias confirmed otherwise. They were already on the outs, and this was just Dan trying to make some extra paper. Unfortunately, all this drama really didn't move the needle in Bloodstorm's favor, which should be shocking to absolutely no one. While I was able to find some evidence via old magazine charts that Bloodstorm was a mild hit in arcades, it, along with the failure of Street Fighter the movie, made for a one-two punch to the company's fortunes. Now, there was always the chance that Bloodstorm could have become a hit for the home, and despite announcing they were going to be doing such with ports to the PlayStation and the Saturn, they didn't, as they were occupied with leaving the video game business altogether. I should clarify it was the Strata Games label that was being put to rest specifically, but Incredible Technologies lingered on and refocused on casino slash gambling games instead, along with the occasional Golden Tea update. 
Thus ends the farty, bloody ballad of Bloodstorm, a game that has been mostly relegated to the dustbin of history, with it being most famous for its ineffective marketing campaign. How does it hold up today, though? Well, we'll see if this storm can weather my critical eye once I get it in the ring. So what's going on here? What's going on with this morbid weather pattern? I have to give it to them, Incredible Technologies did attempt some decent world building here. The intro slash demo crawl, which always scared me as a kid, illustrates the traumatic assassination of the Emperor of Mankind, who is holding the world together after the cataclysmic event called <laughs> the Mega Wars. Mega wow! Since then, life on Earth has degraded into an age of barbarism, nuclear fallout, and cybernetic warfare between vastly different provinces. Instead of trying to solve this case of regicide, they instead decide to hold a tournament called the Bloodstorm to crown a new emperor who will hopefully manage to maintain their groove. These events also triggered the release of an otherworldly uh, demon thing called Korn or Slanesh Necron, I think. I, I don't know. It doesn't matter what their name is. All in all, I think it's a pretty serviceable backstory, and having each fighter hail from a different post-apocalyptic biome leads to a few interesting archetypes, at least more interesting than time killers. Razor is a dashing smuggler who throws, surprise, razors at you. Freon is your Chili McFreeze Sub-Zero parallel. Hellhound is your Scorpion. Tempest is the haughty toddy daughter of the slain Emperor. Talon is the hated heel who's like the king of the cyborgs. Tremor is the stoic mountain man. Mirage is your Amazon warrior woman. And Fallout is your standard mysterious freak from the radioactive wastes. Each one also has a pretty solid ending whenever you beat the arcade ladder, complete with a sizable amount of text and illustrations, except for Hellhounds, which is a bit peculiar as it's simply Hellhound takes charge, Squirt rules the planet burns. I, I don't know what they're going for there with, with that one. Some form of anarchy-inducing subliminal messaging there? I, I, uh... Anyway, all of this is good stuff, but when you actually look at the game, yeah. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but Bloodstorm is one of the ugliest fighters in existence. I, oh wait, I know exactly what it is. It's the clashing of two very different art styles. For the backgrounds and character weapons, they went with a rather rough rendered CGI look. But for the sprites, they stuck with pixel art, which is... I don't know what that is. Why, why would you do that? Why would you do that? It's really the worst of both worlds, not looking as slick as KI and not as timeless as Street Fighter 2. If I squint my eyes, I think Time Killers looks a little better overall, if not more consistent. BS's sprites have this hastily slapped together chunky spot blotchy look to them, but the stages have that basic low detail artificial feel. Nothing exemplifies this dichotomy more than the two end bosses. The first is Chainsaw. I, I think he's called Chainsaw. The game calls him Gargoyle when he wins, who at first glance looks like a rudimentary render of a creature you'd see in a stage background blown up in size. And that's because he is. Look, see him back there? And then we have Necron, the final boss. For all the game does to hype him up, you can only point and laugh because he looks like what you'd get if a child crudely superglued two action figures from two different franchises together. As for the sound and music, there's not much to say. It's drab, scratchy, loud, unappealing, so let's move on to the... This section will matter very little, because there's no point in learning Bloodstorm's mechanics such as they are. Why? Because your typical round looks like this. See, there's so many ways to die in less than 10 seconds in this game, so you might as well not even But Let's go through the mechanics anyway. The basics are really close to Mortal Kombat. No, what? You gain a specific special move. Now, that's kind of neat in a Mega Man ripoff type of way. Now I've got your power. But if you lose a single match, even if you have credits to continue, kiss all your hard-earned moves goodbye, making the feature 
kind of completely pointless. In gameplay, they work a bit like the weapons in Sam Show. They extend your range, can be thrown or picked up by your opponents, etc. They also do more damage and are key to triggering dismemberment attacks, which you want to do, as it's the fastest, most effective way to claiming victory. If you do get an arm or leg taken off, you can no longer use that button or that associated special move, just like in Time Killers. I hated it there, and I hate it here even more. It's never a great design philosophy to take options away from the player just because they got hit by a random normal. Now, let's do a quick comparison. BioFreaks also has a dismemberment system, but it's done via these really slow telegraph specials that aren't too hard to avoid. But in Bloodstorm, it seems like you can get hit by almost anything and you'll lose an important tool. If you get dizzied at any time during a match, the CPU will then always take your head off, regardless of how much health you have. And finally, you can easily jump or walk off certain stages to your death, killing you instantly. What's worse is that all of this shit can happen at any time, even in the first round, with all following rounds ignoring the fact that you just lost your head or penis or whatever. The unique fatalities that each fighter can perform also aren't unique in the traditional sense. They always result in the same damage you see from any of the dismemberment moves. Sometimes there will be an additional flourish, like Freon briefly freezing the opponent, but regardless, they always end with the same couple of chunks on the ground. Considering Bloodstorm is constantly going, hey, hey, look how violent and edgy I am, they really drop the ball with this. Speaking of packing in tons of shit, remember how Mortal Kombat had a single secret fighter or MK2 having several? In another case of one-upmanship, IT hid an additional seven fighters, all of them based on the existing cast with minimal differences outside of their sprites. If you weren't impressed with the A team, lower your expectations even further for the B team. We got Craniac, Dementia, Golem, Blood, Ratchet, Shadow, Wraith, and finally, Sin, who's slightly different from the rest. All of them are known collectively as the agents of Necron, and you gotta do some stupid ass shit to find and fight them. Stuff like uh, throwing an enemy into a particular stage hazard, uh, jump to your death in a specific safe way, figure out how you can actually leap to a background bridge multiple times, you get the idea. Sin, however, is just the sub-boss you fight before Chain Goyle and is the hardest battle in the game, bar none. You're locked in a very tight chamber together with spiked walls closing in, but she has insane priority on everything she does and you're not only fighting her, but the two different time limits. See, the walls close in faster than the default round time and they only kill you, not her. If you find and beat every agent and then knock Ron or, or whatever, you get an additional end screen with a phone number you can contact so you can be in Bloodstorm 2 that never came out. <laughs> Did they take a rain check for that? Finally, they implemented a password system, which obviously means nothing to us in 2022, but if this was in 94, you could save your progress between matches. If the cabinet was ever unplugged though, your precious passwords would no longer work. So, uh, good stuff guys. Now, I will admit, it's pretty clear IT tried to do a few different things here, but none of them really worked out, because they're all kind of hampered and handicapped by the... One thing I can certainly say about the gale force of this storm is that it's pretty fast. Yeah, everything feels wonky and a lot of the special attacks are inconsistent, but at least everything moves at a decent clip. If it was much slower, then oof, we'd have a problem. But while all the instant death moves would be bad enough on their own, when you combine them with a the sloppy, random, and imprecise game feel, within seconds, your fingers just naturally start mashing every button. You start trying to end matches with death moves as fast as possible, as it's what the game was built around, so why bother with fundamentals, special moves, or combos? In fa fact, now that I think about it, the game lacks any sort of dedicated combo system, only going as far as what MK1 allowed you to do, a few select buttons and specials having a few follow-ups. I scoured YouTube and I can't find a single combo video, and that rarely ever happens, but let me know if you've seen one. 
Now, keep in mind, this came out in 1994 when combo systems were almost standard, so it's another final knock against Bloodstorm and its priorities, which were useless passwords and passable powers. Oof, whoa, now that that storm has subsided, I've got a million of these folks. It's actually quite a shame, as I feel there was plenty of squandered potential here. I'm all for gory, violent 90s bloodletting, but that's what separated MK from its contemporaries and wannabes, balancing the blood with distinct, solid gameplay, and unfortunately, that's something incredible technologies failed to do here. If they had had more time to focus on just Bloodstorm and not be co-developing Street Fighter the movie at the same time, I think they might have had something here, or at least put out improved ports on the PlayStation and Saturn. There's nothing horribly egregious here though, not one element that makes it uh, super unplayable or unpleasant, but there's also nothing that's particularly awesome as well, so I think with that, Bloodstorm splatters onto the fairly stinky tier with a dull wet smack. And thus, my quest to find the king of the crap lingers on. And if you'd like me to continue this pointless, depressing road to oblivion, do suggest some games in the comments below, or shout them out over on my Twitter. Until then, warriors, I'll see you next time on The Worst Fighting Game.